so my name is um, Michael Donoghue. I am the um, creative director of Billy Blue Creative here at um, Billy Blue Ultimo Campus. And I'm here to talk to Imogen and to talk to Taylor. Um, and so um, I'll just introduce each of them first. Which, um, and so Imogen is a uh, graduate of the Bachelor of Communication Design here at Billy Blue, um, an ADDA award winner and um, a cu currently designer at um, Smack Bang Designs, which I'm going to ask you a little bit about um, in, in a while. And so um, I know that during your time um, here, I think you've done a, a, an internship with, um, with Vogue Australia, won a prestigious AGDA award. So I'd like to, to know a little bit more about that. And has worked for renowned agencies such as Frost Collective and currently with Smack Bang Designs. Um, and Taylor Cope Wallace, also a graduate of the, um, the Bachelor of Communication Design from here at Billy Blue, um, is the Product and Projects Director at Lad Bible, uh, the Lad Bible Group. And Taylor was a, a scholarship winner at Billy Blue who worked on the uh, world, -class, uh, world class lineup of clients, including, wait for this, Justin Bieber, Vivid Sydney. ANZ, Hyundai, and many more, apparently. You can tell us all about the Justin Bieber experience <laughs> um, in a minute. So I'd just like to um, welcome both of you here, and um, thank you for coming, your coming here today, sharing your time, and more importantly, sharing your experiences with, um, with the Billy Blue crowd. So I'm going to start off um, by saying that we're all driven by very different um, passions and a diverse range of influences in our creative pursuit. So I want to take you back a little bit and um, ask you, what inspired you to become a designer? So I'll start with Imogen. What inspired you to become a designer? Definitely not the typical way to become a designer, but actually started you know, getting interested in design by doing what I didn't want to do, which was studying law. Um, that was the first thing I jumped into after high school. I you know, loved research, I loved learning, and it just kind of made sense to me, oh, I'll just do something in law, and after a couple of years, I was like, I definitely could not be wearing a suit for the rest of my <laughs> life. Um, and I always, you know, since I was um, little, I was always looking at like logos and uh, other designs, and you know, I often quite, still to this day, will choose a wine bottle based off the label rather than anything else. Um, and I think from that point, it was kind of like, yeah, I need to do something in design. So it was kind of a nice exploration though to kind of see what I didn't want to do to realize what I did want to do. And once I fell into design, it was just like, you know, match made in heaven. It just, everything sort of seemed to flow. And, um, you know, coming to Billy Blue really sort of helped me enhance that love and go straight into the industry and tackle it. It was been great. So is a, a general awareness of design that you always felt you had? You were, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's interesting you should say that. First thing is that um, the, do, do you see parallels between the way you thought as a lawyer and the way you think as a designer? Absolutely. Like it, you don't think that two two those sort of subjects would ever sort of collide. But I actually really found the research aspect of that I did a lot when I was studying law was so correlated in terms of design. I think they're so important now to be re-engaged with you know what's what's the latest trends and what's the innovation and what what are people doing outside of your industry because that's the stuff that really informs your design decisions and what's going to make an amazing brand down the track and often I find if I'm about to start a new project instead of just jumping straight into drawings which you know we all want to do we always want to design something that's really beautiful but we need to step back and do some research do some critical thinking about you know what does this brand look like in five years ten years what are the competitors what are they you know what are they looking to do for the future and i think having that backing of you know stepping taking a step back think about the you know the research behind it um, has been key. Mm -hmm. no, I, I think that's a really good point and sometimes I talk to my students about you know think like a lawyer yeah. because because in actual fact the um, you know I think the presentations before the, the discussions before brought up this idea of aesthetics and aesthetics are you know it's, it's, a, it's a styling process but in actual fact you have to be very analytical mm. about design before you even get to to that level of 
a veneer. If I say veneer, that's, that sounds derogatory. But, um, but that idea of styling comes is built on the foundations of something that's quite analytical and research. -free. Absolutely. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, we can all design something that's beautiful and that's nice to look at. But if it's not backed up by you know, consumer insights and future trends and innovation, then that brand's just going to cease to be relevant. And you know, it's not going to like last the test of time. And you, know, you often find that brands that are sort of are lasting out there are ones who just have like have the have the research back to them, and that's that's what we need to do. Great. My my second question, uh, based on your first answer, was: Have you gone with Have you gone with the quality of the wine versus the design of the wine labels? Oh no, always the wine label. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Definitely, um, definitely grown from that. But it's interesting you brought up wine because. Um, one of the clients that I actually pitched to was, was Jacob's Creek, and that was kind of like my, like, oh, this is a design bucket list, isn't it? Just like come full circle, choo choosing something based off a label to actually designing a label. So I guess one of the actual best things about design I found is like seeing your work in the real world is just like absolute killer. Like I was just saying to the guys before that the first time I um, saw someone like wearing my design, I had to stop myself from being like, can I just take a picture? And you know, that, that's actually... Yep. <laughs> it didn't actually, but <laughs> yeah, it's quite a buzz, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Great, Taylor. Like the same question to you. What what inspired you to to become a, a designer? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's. I graduated a lot later than you, so it's kind of a trip back memory lane. But I remember kind of primary school, high school, spending a lot more time on the visual aspect of a essay rather than the essay itself. And you know, I got a lot of support from my art teacher and things like that. And I ended up just kind of cruising into a, a role that you know I ended up enjoying a lot more because of that. Um, design was just a natural part of what I used to do, um, and it's funny that you know you think you you want to be a certain type of person or a certain type of career. Design is is something that you kind of attribute or like um, attach yourself to at a young age. Uh, hence, you end up studying a kind of a course like design. But I feel like for me personally. Um, it was the, the precursor or the, you know, the, the dip in the toes, you know, of what could be a career, you know, um, that's much largely attributed to the creative industry. So, yeah. Um, Did you always feel like you knew what kind of designer you were going to be? Or? I always dreamt of, like, oh, I'm going to be this creative director, you know, like yourself. Like, I always kind of thought, like, that's the pinnacle of what I need to be working towards. Um, and I feel like that's kind of how you approach your early stages of a career. Um, you kind of have this kind of goal that you kind of, you know, see in um, articles and, you know, see online and things like that. But I think particularly for me, like, it's, it, my role has changed so, so fundamentally. Mm. Um, and I think that it's really important to note that, like, things are moving so quickly these days. The role that you thought you, you, you aspired for is... You know, you know, will be something completely different in five, even two years' time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, the, I, I think the, the the possibilities just open up before you in lots of ways. So you go in at, at one level, and and then I, I think it's, it's then that the pathway often um, reveals itself. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I think that. What's interesting about that is that that we that we all start from these different positions, and we're. Um, and from my point of view, I was really into punk music. And so I was designing little fanzines and sticking them together and photocopying yeah. them and selling them. And then, and then I realized, oh, this could be a job. You know, this, I, this, uh, that, that I could be involved in this, in, in this industry. Yeah. Um, and and you know, the design back then was, was very different. And I know people who've come to the design industry through graffiti. For, yeah. for example. And so I think that what we can see here is that we all have these very different creative impulses and they can all feed into the, the sort of educational system. And then from that, obviously, we can start to, to, to spread out and to start to you know, find our own way and develop yeah. you know, in new paths. Completely. Yeah. Like, I think there's no one cookie cutter creative. Mm. You know, my dad's an accountant and my mum's coming from an interior design background. My girlfriend's an interior designer. There's no one answer to being a creative. I think like you can apply a creative thinking to any aspect of a career. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think one of the things with design, communications design, is you learn a framework for that thinking, learn a discipline and you know, an attitude to bringing that. And I think the guys mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily 
um, mean that you should limit yourself to one specific uh, discipline per se, like graphic design. You know, these days a designer needs to work in motion graphics, mixed media, um, even like interiors and things like that. Like it's it's about that flexibility and it's um, you know the framework in which you approach that is really important. Great. Um, I'm just going to um, move on to the idea of you know, leaving college and leaving university, becoming a um, a professional designer. And Imogen, I'm going to. Um, Given Billy Blue's reputation for embracing the unorthodox, then I came across the quote by Tess Robinson, which, um, is, who's the, the founder of, uh, of um, Smack Bang um, Creative. Um, this is the quote. We're fearful of the norm and use our innate curiosity, open minds and daring spirits to keep mediocrity at bay. I thought that was really yeah. inspirational. He's a good and, writer. Yeah, yeah, no, it's <laughs> yeah. beautiful. Um, so I guess what I'd like to, to um, know about is the, the culture that you now work in, mm. the, the culture of um, Smackbang um, Designs, and, and what you do there. What, what's your, you know, what does your day look like? And yeah, day to day. Um, it changes every day, which I think is part of the exciting part about being a designer is that and especially as well, graphic designer is if you're looking at interiors and that sort of stuff, which you could have a project for years, whereas graphic design, you could have a project for two weeks. Mm. Um, and it's always changing and it's always evolving. And so one day I might be working on creating a website or the other day I might be running a photo shoot um, or I might be um, checking print proofs for a packaging that I've just designed. Um, so it changes very, it varies day to day, which is always exciting because there's nothing worse than when you're working on a project, especially if one if you don't like for ages and ages and you're just thinking, God, I just want to do something else um, but it's good to I think what's been really great about um, working with someone with Smack Bang who are very varied in sort of their disciplines so they don't they do everything from branding packaging website um, the whole lot and so I've really got to um, expand my skills in every skill set I didn't become a specialist in any way but um, you know I get to work on um, you know websites and stuff and recently I've taught myself to do motion as well so I'm doing a lot more of animation as well and stuff like that and I think having those extra skill sets that you know you're not really spread thinly I feel like you're like a master of all of them and I find that's really helpful and it applies to almost every project that I get to and especially motion as, as you mentioned like that's something that's come up recently is so important in terms of um, pe getting people engaged on social media and stuff like that and you know I had to teach myself how to do motion um, it was actually one of my old colleagues who was a motion designer and after work I just sort of said oh can you know can you um, teach me a couple of things over a beer and um, you know after a while I ended up learning my skills and now it's like one of the um, the best qualities that I have and whenever I present something to a client I've animated their logo they're just blown away and it you know it sells it sells it straight away um, but yeah like day to day always changes and whether it's something conceptual where I'm just sitting down like drawing and just like having a troll through some fonts that I really love or maybe it's something that's really practical and I'm standing up and doing a photo shoot um, it changes and I think that's great mm. I think you, you mentioned the the idea of curiosity there which I think is the the one um, the one character that I always look for in a designer, we, you know, we, we can teach skills, yeah. but actually this idea of curiosity, always seeking something new, I think is intrinsic to all um, great designers. Yeah. So um, just a little bit more then about the, um, about the culture, because I, I think one of the things that, that's interesting is that you, you, you move from design studio to design studio and each place has yeah. its own individual culture. And I, and I, I looked at um, a Smoke Bang and, and it did seem to have a, a, an identifiable um, creative culture. Could mm. you could you explain? Could you yeah, expand like, on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I think what I've sort of learned being in a couple of different agencies and stuff is that it's so important to find a culture that you resonate with and that you um, you know you're with people that you admire and you're passionate um, to work with and you're going for a common goal. I think um, it's been a really great aspect and so. The, the sort of culture that I have there is is awesome. Everyone is very collaborative, very open, and you know I've worked in agencies and with designers before who were very you know 
secretive and working their silos and what I found with these guys is that they were very much like let's just throw it out there what do we think of this let's get some ideas let's get some feedback and it's all about that collaboration um, which I found really inspiring and really helped to elevate all of our work together um, so that's been an awesome aspect of mm. working in the team. That's lovely that's, that's a really good insight into I think that um, you do have to you know as a as a young designer entering the industry it is about finding where you fit in and mm. and then that's not, not only about the work that you do but it is definitely about the, the people that you work with the, this idea the idea of a collaboration you know and, and the idea of, uh, of having a good cultural fit for uh, for yourself so I'm glad you found that <laughs> um, okay and Taylor again you know a, a similar question for I'm just going to uh, again just read a little um, quote here um, I'm just going to frame actually for those of you who are not um, familiar so familiar with Lud Bible I'm just going to um, frame it with just quite how influential um, Lud Bible is um, Lad Bible were winners of the Khan Lion Festival for Creativity, taking home eight awards, including two Grand Prix accolades for their Trash Isles environmental campaign. Since its launch in 2012, Lad Bible has posted um, nearly 7,000 um, 7, videos, which have um, attracted over 5 billion, 5 billion views on Facebook. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Surprises me, I guess. Yeah. So, um, so my my question to is, can you um, tell us a little bit about what life's like at Lad Bible? I'm particularly interested in its philosophy and your role as the products and projects director. Yeah, which is something which is a mouthful of a title. Yeah, no, it's like to be honest, it's a mouthful for me. We call it P and P, and nobody knows what that means. So probably you've nailed it. Um, I've been there um, since, since, since its inception in Australia. Right. So they launched commercial operations in Australia in 2019. There were three of us that started. And now we're uh, 30 people. And that's what, two years of massive growth, um, millions and millions of dollars of revenue generated. We're launching an office in uh, Auckland, in Melbourne, and soon to be Singapore. So huge growth, really exciting times. Um, and I think like that's um, part of a driver for me. You know, you're working. I mean, I think you mentioned before, like working in a smaller team. You're you're not just about a designer in front of a Mac. You know, you're solving problems with a, a finance person, or you're kind of uh, you know approaching a marketing PR release or something like that. I think there's much more to being creative um, than just um, you know the tools that you get taught in in university. So in terms of the culture, you know, what Lab Bible's like, I think the founder, Solly and Arian, founders, um, you know, just had a kid, he's, he's not even 30 yet, and these, these guys have come out of university and created a, um, what is nearly one of the biggest social media brands in the world. Um, and I think it's really, really inspirational to see how they've taken a company as small as, you know, five people in, in Manchester and grown it to be you know, nearly 500 people in Manchester, London, Ireland, Sydney, and now a couple of different APAC regions. So there's this huge sense of kind of growth and excitement and mutual kind of advancement. Mm. Um, and that's really exciting for me. You know, I think the, the ability to be involved, the, you know, the, um, the, you know the, um, the experience, it's been something that I've kind of treasured as one of my, you know, most, you know, highlighted experiences of my career. And I think I'm, you and I are relatively new into it. So, mm, definitely. yeah, no, I'm loving it. Right. You know, all the best things start in Manchester. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said that from, I'm from Manchester. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, great. So, I, I, I think that that, uh, that idea of the, a small team being able to achieve so much, you know, all, yeah, global dominance in, in some ways is really interesting because, yeah. and, and I think that's that's about how it's about that youthful approach. I mm. think in lots of ways that that sort of freshness and and being able to see new opportunities. So I think that's that's awesome. Yeah, um, completely great. And you know, is there a philosophy that that drives Lad Bible? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. We've started to spend a lot more time on that because I think it's really important. Previously, we've been kind of like reactively growing with this kind of volatile, you know, social space, which you know, in a lot of times, we don't really have a lot of control over. So we've started to kind of build out more of a mission statement. Um, 
And I think that off the top of my head, it's you know um, building communities of you know the world's youth that laugh, think, uh, and act. And I think like that's really true to what we try to do. You know, there's not only the viral nature of the videos that we push out, but there's also campaigns like you mentioned, Trash Isles. We're about to launch one on Amazon Prime Video called Unheard, um, which is a big streaming on demand um, provider that will be running a six part series about racial mon minorities in Australia. There's uh, an audience that we have at scale that um, you know, a lot of other traditional publishers don't have. I think there's a, there's a responsibility there to kind of move away from what is traditionally known as lad or lad culture. Mm. Um, and the, the UK counterparts, my colleagues over there, have been kind of moving through that process. And you know, it's an interesting experience here in Australia as well to kind of tackle that branding. Mm. And I think, just to, just to finish off on that point, I think one of the, the really interesting things here is that design can change people's perceptions. You know, it's not too big a claim to say that we can change the world through design. You know, at, at its best. You know, it can be ephemeral and it can be, um, it can be whimsical. And you know, you mentioned the the idea of, of, of la laughing. You know, I think yeah. you know it can be it can be humorous, but also actually it can shape the way um, shape our future. No, it's so okay. true. And design doesn't need to be aesthetically cutting edge. You know, design can be functional, anti-design almost. Like yeah. you can. Design with a sense of you know um, creating something more approachable to a certain audience, and it doesn't you know design is a, a language you know multiple languages, so it's really about kind of learning how to harness that, understand when to apply that in certain circumstances. Great. Um, do, did either of you um, you know what was your biggest surprise about entering the workforce? Oh, biggest surprise. If you've got an answer, I need to. <laughs> I mean, I think like I was just. I, I was shocked by how much I held myself at such a high value and that I think um, some of the guys mentioned before, it's like when you do your portfolio, you're so, you're so invested in it. Like everything is about you being this, you know, um, unrealistic, you know, value of yourself. And, you know, the people in um, the industry just don't have time. They're not thinking like that. Yeah. You know, their job is to hire the best person that fits in with the culture. You know that fits in with the the people that they have there at that particular time, the the right skill set, the right level of experience, and there's all these elements that you, you just don't really realise. You just think, you know, like I've achieved so much, I've spent so much time on my portfolio. Why, you know, yeah. why isn't this being of value to them? Yeah, um, and you struggle with that. I think that's an interesting point because I think the, the outside perception of a designer is that they are ego driven. Yeah. And when you get into the industry, you find out I've got to work with all these people, and actually there's no time for egos, yeah. you know, and there's no place for that yeah. because Definitely. you know you were talking about collaboration before. Yeah. Actually, it's about what we can all achieve. Yeah, and they touched on it before. It's like don't take things personally. I think when I first started, it was very much like if no one likes my design, then I'm an awful designer. But it's more than that. It's about like you said, the language that where people are speaking to and it's so important that you're addressing the the client and then rather the client's customer base that they're, they're referring to and I think what's been great about for example when I do collaboration it might be something like everyone in the team's like let's just scroll as many logo ideas as we can on a wall and let's just go yep nup yep nup and you know that kind of is like oh, a bit heartbreaking like that's my that's my work but you know it's it's all about like vetting those and you know getting the best outcome out of that and so yeah it's been a surprise for me to take a little bit more of it like the the design armor as Brie was saying mm. earlier and just you know taking it on the chin and go know what's the best outcome for the client for the business yep. um, and that commercial decision yeah and I think the what was also brought up before is this idea that you have to learn to sell an idea. You have to learn to take a, a, a client on a journey um, so that, in fact, when you present your idea, they're already in there. They're, they already know that, oh, that's what I was thinking. And that, that's, I think that's the, the, in the it's, it's, it sounds horrible to say that you've got to sell an idea because it's, it sounds you know, sort of very salesman-like, but in actual fact, you've got to learn you do. To And it's also like, if you can't sell it to the client, how are they going to sell it to their customers? Yeah. So you've got to get them on board, get them excited, get them passionate, and then, then their customers will be like, oh, all about that, and everyone want to get involved. So. Awesome. Great, I've got um, just a couple more questions, which, um, to, to both of you, what was the most valuable thing that you learned at Billy Blue um, that you've taken with you throughout your career, do you think? Um, 
I have uh, two parts. One of them is, more, the, I guess, the more practical side, and you just touched on it before, but um, the presentation skills. And, you know, it's, I understand it's not everyone's favourite activity to stand up in front of and do public speaking, but the fact that Billy Blue made you present every assessment and every idea, and you had to really stand up in front of your peers and say it, and even if you felt like you were saying something stupid, and, you know, it's so important. And, you know, it's what a great time to practice and do it here when there's people who will give you that constructive criticism, because there is so much presenting in design, and like you said, selling the idea and standing in front of the client and getting to sign the dotted line on terms of like a concept or, or an idea. So in terms of the practical skills, that was something that I really took from and was really grateful for. And then the other side of it as well is that, you know, don't take design so seriously. I think you've got to have fun. Design is meant to be fun. It's meant to be engaging. And um, yeah, I think when I was here, I was really enjoyed just like doing fun things and trying out new ideas. And you still need to do that in the outside world. And, and when something sticks, it sticks. Yep, um, that's good. Good point, remember. It made yeah. design fun. Right? <laughs> it has to be. Yeah, I mean, completely agree. Like, I think um, one of the biggest things I took away from Billy Blue is like design is a collaborative experience and you're doing it with your peers, right? Like, you're, you're, you're in there solving a problem together. It's not just you, like, in an echo chamber, kind of trying to kind of figure out a problem. Like, I think you need to use the resources and the different personalities around you. So, you know, I think Billy Blue really encouraged that, that kind of collaborative work, you know, understanding different personalities and how they can bring different things to, you know, a problem. Mm. Great. Thanks for that. That was awesome. This is the first time I've met um, both of you, and, <laughs> and I learned a few things as well, so that's, that's really good. So I think what we'll do now is open it up to um, a, a couple of questions, if anyone has any questions for... Uh, I've got one that's come from our live stream. So it's actually from one of our graduates, but they graduated from the Diploma of Marketing um, with Torrance University, and they've said, I felt the need to do something that's a bit more creative. Do you think that having the experience and knowledge in marketing will help in communication design? Absolutely, yeah. I think there's so many factors in terms of what you need to know when you're doing the graphic design, but marketing more than ever is so important. Everyone's on social media, everyone needs a website, and if you had that background knowledge in marketing and you know how the consumer's thinking and behaving, that's just going to, you know, add worlds of worth to, to your work in graphic design. Yeah, completely agree. Like, the amount of times that a marketing manager has come up and asked a design-related question, you know, I think, like, that knowledge, that prior knowledge would be so useful. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. Another question, how did you get your first job after you finished uni? Um, so, after I finished uni, it, and, you know, we had a fantastic, um, one of our last courses we did in my last semester was to put together your portfolio. And, you know, like you said, it's, it was great to force you to do that because it's something that you just would cont continuously put yourself off. So I created my portfolio and as soon as I graduated, I sent it out to, you know, a couple of agencies that I really wanted to work for um, and just put it out there. I didn't wait for a, um, a job ad or anything like that. I was like, I really love your work. This is why and I'd love to work for you. And then um, it was Frost Collective that called me up and just sort of said, come in for a chat. And then I was working with them in the next couple of weeks. So I always found that it never hurts to ask the question. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to wait for the right role to come up. You just, you got to talk to people. You got to get in the ear, and you know. Did you yeah. play on the fact that your name was Frost? I oh, know. <laughs> we were talking about before. It's yeah, like it's, <laughs> maybe that was no, no, no. Um, no, he's, he's lovely, but definitely not related. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, completely. Like I think you just got to get stuck in. Um, there's no harm in sending an email mm. and then or even calling or, you know, we have people all the time kind of messaging us and, you know, those people stand out. Um, there's so many people that just send, um, you know, emails off on job applications and it's really hard to kind of um, weed through those people. Mm. So the people that do kind of chase something aggressively really do stand out. Mm. Um, same for me, like a couple of uh, studios that I really wanted to work for um, and, yeah, I was lucky enough to get an internship um, at a Sydney studio, so uh, Eskimo Design. So I think like um, it's all, it's it's all about just being aggressive on it, um, doing what you can to um, take up the opportunities that you're given. 
I think um, that's a really interesting point, actually, because I think both of you knew the sort of people you were wanting to work for. And I think that, that's really important because, you know, what kind of designer do you want to be? And I, I think I asked you that um, earlier on. But at the end of your course, then the way that you can tailor your portfolio, you know, you, mm. you, can, you can target it to the people that you want to work for. And I think that the showing, it's, it's, not, it's not putting yourself out there going, I want a job is yeah. actually actually I want to work for you and I want to mm. work for you for these reasons because I admire what you do and yeah. that will actually resonate with mm. with those employees definitely not advocating you send out a million yeah. million things but, no, no. you know be be intent, intent you know have an intention in terms of who you're applying for and yeah just about selecting those portfolio pieces that you know that, that you think they will gravitate to and also choosing things that um, you know that you're passionate about and that you can talk about and um, again sell, sell yourself in yep. <laughs> And explore like other formats as well. Like it doesn't need to be a PDF. It can be things like Squarespace. Mm -hmm. There's other tools out there to create your portfolio in a really dynamic, easy to send out way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the amount of times I've tried to open a 10 megabyte PDF off an email, like I'll just, I, I, like you kind of have to move on. So, you know, if it's really easy, think like if uh, the, you mentioned before about, you know, you've got three seconds, like how does that create an impression? Yeah. Um, to the person that's receiving it. I was old it. school. I sent mine by post. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, that can I work did, equally well, well I guess. Yeah, I work. think that's really interesting because yeah. we were talking about this in the studio uh, recently with a, with a student, with a graduate. In the, um, it, it, direct mail is so not used these days yeah. that actually it's quite surprising. But it's yeah. going to stand out somehow. <laughs>